the ark that did battle for us. So the Jewish people are now going to be heading towards the land of Israel after a number of detours and a number of difficulties and challenges. We are finally ready to leave Har Sinai. In fact, we did leave Har Sinai. Not really appropriately, but we left Har Sinai. We left it a little too happily, a little too joyously to get away from the mountain where it all happened. We had a bit of a debacle where Yisro decided to bail. Moshe Rabbeinu is not happy about that. The public relations fallout is huge. It was a big deal when Yisro came. And that's why the Zohar says the Torah couldn't be given until Yisro actually committed to join the Jewish people. Moshe Rabbeinu pleads with him to stay with us. According to many opinions, Yisro actually does come to Eretz Yisrael later, and he lived in Yericho, the city of Jericho, which is an, an ancient Jewish city. Al Kalpanim, in Parshas Ba'aloischa, towards the end of chapter 10, the Torah begins to tell us about the Jewish people's first journey. And we're going to pick it up this morning at verse 33. Vayisu mehar Hashem. They set forth from the mountain of Hashem. Uh, pardon me, this is in the Gemara. The Gemara tells us in Shabbos, in Avkuftah's Zion, and the Masha elaborates on this, that the reason that we emphasize that it's Har Hashem is because the Jewish people were turning away from Hashem in this journey, as mentioned. It wasn't, well, they didn't leave properly. They said, oh, let's get out of here before he gives us a 614th mitzvah. So it's not a compliment. But nonetheless, despite the fact that Am Yisrael did not behave appropriately, they were happy to leave Har Sinai, Har Hashem. The Torah tells us that they traveled Derech Shalosh Yomim, the way, which is three days, three days of travel. The Ark of the Covenant of God travels before them. Derech Shalosh Yomim, the way of three days. So the Torah tells us twice in the same Pasuk. The Torah tells us that Vayisu Mehar Hashem, they went from the mountain of Hashem, Derech Leish Leish Yomim, this is talking about the people. And then it says the Ark of Hashem's covenant went before them the way of three days. Lasur Lahem Menucha, to clear the way for them so that they would be in a state of peace or serenity. So Rashi says, Derech Shlesh Yomim, he's now commenting on the first, the first time the Torah, the Pasuk says, Derech Shlesh Yomim. What does that mean? Mahalach Shlesh Yomim. That means that the space, what would have taken three days, doesn't mean they actually traveled for three days. And the obvious question, certainly in Pshut Shal Mikra, how could you travel for three days? Even forget the fact that there's women and children. Forget the fact that there have to be elderly people. Forget the fact that people don't have the, the stamina to do one of these crazy uh, marches. You know, these 25 kilometer or 50 kilometer marches in the, in the desert. How do you go for three days? So Rashi says it doesn't mean three days. It means they went the space, the distance of three days. And holchu b'yim echad. They did this in one day. In other words. This is a form of what we call kfitza saderach. Kfitza saderach means when the the way or the ground is accelerated. Here the ground wrinkles or the ground moves underneath your feet. Maybe we could think of the moving sidewalks that you have in the airport today. So you get onto that sidewalk, somebody else is walking right next to you just as fast, but you get to three times faster. Why? Because you're walking and the ground is moving as well. So I'll call upon him. This is the meaning of Derech Shleish Yom. Why would that happen? That's a miracle after all. And why, says the Torah, says Rashi, would the Torah tell us this, this, this miracle? All of this is, Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to bring them into Eretz Yisrael immediately. And because Hashem wanted to bring them into Eretz Yisrael more quickly, that's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu accelerated the process and they went very very quickly now the truth is this is the opinion of Rashi that Derech Shleish Yomim means the space of three days and Abar Benel says the same thing 
Some of the Rishona, however, suggest that when the Torah says Derech Shleish Yamim, it does mean Derech Shleish Yamim. And here we have two schools of thought. Rashbam tells us that Derech Shleish Yamim should be taken literally. So how did, how did that happen? I don't know. I suppose that's another kind of miracle. Just like it's possible for people to be able to go Derech Shleish Yamim, to people to be able to travel what takes three days in one day, so well, maybe Hashem gave them the strength. He gave them the, the ability to walk for three days without stopping. Ramban says it doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us. Did they stop at night? Didn't they stop at night? It doesn't tell us. And, and like we say, so, so Ramban says it's left open. You can interpret the miracle either way you want. Certainly something miraculous took place. Either Hashem gave the koyach, the stamina, for them to be able to go for three days, or HaKadosh Baruch Hu enabled them to be able to walk in one day what it would take three days. The Rivash of Yosef Bechar Shor has a very interesting approach to this. He says that the Jewish people would travel during the day and they would sleep at night. But it's called Derech Shleish Yom because they travel three days consecutively. And, and, and because of that, he suggests that there's no miracle here at all. This is not a miraculous thing. This is just that they traveled three days in a row. Now, the Torah goes on to say that they travel the Yisum Har Hashem Derech Shleish Yom. But then we have a second statement that Arayim Bris Hashem, they say Alif Nehem. The Arayim Bris, the Ark of the Covenant, traveled before them. And from the emphasis that it traveled before them, clearly, it's not that they went with kept pace. The Torah doesn't say that the Jewish people travel the Yisum Meher Hashem Derech Shleish Yomim Ve'Arayim Bris Hashem Imohem and that the Ark of the Covenant was with them. The Torah says they traveled three days. In any which way you want to learn that, in any which way you want to understand that. But not only does it say they traveled three days, the Torah goes on to tell us that furthermore, that the Ark was Lifnehem, that the Ark of the Covenant traveled before them for three days. So what does this mean? The first question we're going to ask is, which Ark is this? Who, what is the Arayim Bris Hashem? Which Ark? So Rashi says that this Arun is not one of the artifacts that was used in the Mishkan. This is not the famous Ark of Gold, or three arcs really, one inlaid and the other, an exterior box that was made of gold, an inner box of wood, and then another box of gold with golden shroom on top. No, he says, this is not that ark. Rather, This is the ark that would go with them to war. And what was placed in that ark? If the ark that Bitzal built had within it the Luchot Abrit, what was placed within the ark that had this, that went to war with them? And in it was shivrei luchais. This was the chips, the pieces of the broken luchot, the first set of luchot, the first set of tablets that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Moshe Rabbeinu that was broken when Moshe Rabbeinu saw the Jewish people making a golden calf. And they were munachim, they were placed inside it. So now... With regard to this ark that Moshe Rabbeinu was told by God to make when he first came down on Yom Kippur for this, for, after with the second Luchot, there was not even yet a commandment to raise money for the Mishkan. Forget about making the Mishkan. Where would you put the Luchot? So Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu that you should make yourself an ark. And that ark that you make yourself, you should put the Luchot inside. Later, when Betzalel makes the Aron and the Jewish people establish the Mishkan, the Luchot are removed from the Ark that Moshe Rabbeinu built by his own hand, and then are placed in the Ark that Betzalel built and crafted. And what happens to that Ark? That's what the Shiva HaLuchas go after. Or one, one could suggest that the Shiva HaLuchas were always there. They remained there afterwards. That Ark contained both the actual Luchot and the Shiva HaLuchot. And subsequently, only the Shiva HaLuchot was there. And this is similar to what we learned that Hashem says, Ki Hashem lefnechem lochem, that God will go before you to do battle for you. Where do we see that God goes before you to do battle for you? This is the notion of that ark. Now Rashi goes on to explain the Torah says two times, Derech Yom. It says, Vayisu, they traveled Mehar Hashem Shleish Yom. 
And then it says a second time later, Derech Shleishes Yomim. If the ark was keeping pace with the Jewish people, with Am Yisrael, then it simply would have said that they went, Mehar Hashem Derech Shleishes Yomim, Ve'areim Bris Hashem Imohem. The ark was with them. But here it says that the Aroin Bris, and there's Neisea, it traveled Lifneihem before them. What is the meaning of Neisea Lifneihem? Umagdim Lifneihem, the ark, set forth before them, Derech Shleishes Yomim, the way of three days. And the reason that the ark did this was Lesakein Lahem, Makoim Lechanoyo, to prepare them an appropriate place to camp. Okay, what does that mean to prepare them an appropriate place to camp? So here we have a number of different Midrashic traditions. The Medrash Tanchuma says that the, Bri- that the Aroim Bris came before them. It destroyed all of the snakes. It burnt, it killed the snakes. It says, Horag Anachashim. Saraf, it burnt. The Kaitzim, whatever kind of thorns or thistles or obstacles would be in the way. And it also eliminated Say Nehem shall Yisrael, the enemies of the Jewish people. Now the Abar Benel disagrees with all of this. The Abar Benel and Ramban, at least Ramban and Pashas Ekev, but Abar Benel quotes Ramban in his commentary on Pashas Baal Eishcha. Abar Benel tells us that this ark was the ark of Betzalel and that this ark only once went Lifnehem. The obvious question is, how could you say this is the ark that went Lifnehem? We have a clear instruction in the Torah that the ark should be at the epicenter of the camp of the Jewish people. And that the, the Am Yisrael camped around the Ark, and the Ark represents the heart of the Jewish people. So if the Ark is the heart of the Jewish people, and Am Yisrael traveled in formation with the Ark at the epicenter, how could you understand this passage that says that the Reim Bris Hashem is Helech Lifneim, that the Ark of God's covenant goes before them? So the Abar Benel says it went once before them. That was the first journey. That was where there was people waiting in ambush. They wanted to strike at us. They had been waiting for this for a long time, waiting for us to leave Harsinai, and the ark struck him down. How did the ark strike him down? So the Medish Lamdenu, as well as the Sifri, says that there was fire that sh- was shooting from the Bade, Mibain Bade Ha'ar, and there was poles on this ark, and fire was shooting. It's literally like a sci-fi event. And there's a Medish that says that the ark began to move, and then either there was Kohenim who carried it, or, according to some opinions, the Chizkuni suggests that Moshe Rabbeinu carried it. And he says there's a Pasuk in the Vihayom that talks about Moshe and Aaron and Miriam being the expeditionary force, that the three of them, their, their triangle went in front of the Jewish people, and Moshe was carrying that ark, and they did this to clear the way. And literally, this is where the ark, it says, Mizdazdeya, the ark used to start to tremble, and start to move, like, pick me up. Or, according to another opinion, the Medish Lamdeinu says, the ark hovered. A hovercraft, and this hovercraft was moving miraculously, and maybe Moshe and, and Miriam were there, or maybe there was a few Kohenim there also. We don't know, but this ark literally was shooting laser beams or some kind of fire and destroying our enemies. The Medrash Lekach says, "Man meches it flattened the tall mountains so the Jewish people shouldn't have to go up and down in valleys and mountains of sand. Magbia es hamokim." Or as a man, it, it, it elevated the low valleys. And finally, it was Mashva Derech. The truth is that an army goes to battle today. There's a very important part of every single invading force. And that's, that's the force that comes before. It's like engineering corps. The engineering corps, they are under fire and they actually have to build bridges and they have to deal with whatever kind of obstacles would be in the road so that when the attack force comes through, they can go without any kind of inhibition, any kind of obstacles. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu was both the army and the engineering corps. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the ark came and created a typography that would be hospitable to the Jewish people's encampment. It got rid of all of the negativity. We're talking about snakes and scorpions, killed them, burnt them. It literally shot the enemies, ruined the enemies. According to another medrash, it created a smoke screen and they were terrified, they ran away. At any rate, the ark did battle for us. And, and, and it enabled us to be able to go forward. And that's how the Jewish people traveled. According to Rashi, Chizkuni, and most of the other Rishonim, this kind of event happened each time there was a journey. And all of the Mem Beis Masois, all of the 42 journeys, this is what the ark did. According to Abar Benel and according to Ramban, 
that that school of thought is in Chazal also, in the, of, of our sages, that this happened twice. It happened when the Jewish people left first journey, and it happened when they entered into, into Eretz Yisrael, right to the edge of Eretz Yisrael, the, the last journey. But at any rate, everybody will have to agree that the Ark did battle for us. And But Rashi will emphasize, and most of the Rishonim say, that the Ark that did the battle for us was the Ark that Moshe Rabbeinu built, that miraculously went before the Jewish people, three days ahead of them, cleared everything before Am Yisrael came. They didn't even have to come and see the skirmish, the battle, the smoke, the fire. Everything was clear. By the time they came, everything was peaceful and serene. They didn't see the land rearrange itself. They didn't see the collapse of mountains and the elevation of valleys. They didn't see the enemies being blown out of the, out of the, out of, out of, out of the water, literally. They didn't see any of this. They came three days later, and the Aron was there. So here's the big question. So if you talk about the opinion of a Barbanel and Amban, okay, so this, this makes, it's, I mean, it makes sense. It's a miracle. It doesn't exactly, it's not a logical, or rational thing. But the point is, it's not, it's not hard to understand how the Luchot Habrit, how the, 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 the Ten Commandments, says, if, as, as, if, as it were, people like to call it that, right? The, the, the tablets, the Luchot that Moshe Rabbeinu brought down, that they had the ability to, to do battle for us, that they are a zechut for us. But the problem is that Rashi tells us that this is the ark that Moshe Rabbeinu first built, but it was not an empty ark. But this ark that always went to battle for them was the ark of the Shiver HaLuchot. The ark that contained the pieces of the Luchot that Moshe Rabbeinu broke. And even the Abarbanel would agree that the pasuk, that the verse that says that Hashem HaHolich Lefnechem, that God who goes before you, and it doesn't say later on in the Jewish history that the ark actually was this miraculous hovercraft or that it was, was shooting laser beams and eliminating enemies. But the ark went with them. And it provided them with moral strength, it provided them with courage, it provided them with inspiration. And literally, it, it brought the Shechina with them. So the Jewish people, when they went to war, they didn't go alone. They felt Hashem was going with them. And we should point out, as we always do, that there's no such thing as a holy war in Judaism. It's not a Mechem, it's Kedish. War is not holy. War is horrible. War is, war, is, war is hell. It's a moral war. A war is sometimes necessary. Just like, God forbid, an amputation is necessary, God forbid, to save somebody's life. There's no joy in an amputation. There's no happiness in it. We don't rejoice in battle. We don't, we're not happy to go to war. We don't believe that that is the best way to live. And we don't lionize warriors. We lionize people who are in Melcham Teshaltayda, the sages whose life was devoted to the wars, the Torah wars. We, we, we lionize those who succeed in the debating team, not those who succeed with weapons. But nonetheless, sometimes a war was necessary. And as long as there will be evil in the world, and tragically there is much of it, then there will have to be moral people who will carry weapons to defend the innocent. So we have this Aron that went and did battle for Am Yisrael from evildoers who sought to harm us in the beginning of our journeys, or maybe throughout the entire 40 years. And in it was Shiv Haluchat. So the Rebbe asks, page Kuf Samach Zayin in the Burem book, the Rebbe asks, Yesh this is really, it's very surprising. In fact, it's astonishing. Eich Yitochen, how is it possible? Shadavke B'Shosher B'nei Yisrael Yetzim L'Amulchama, that at the time that Am Yisrael goes out to battle, which this is a sha'a, shaba, him zakukim, l'racham e shamayim e rubim. It's a time when you need a lot of mercy. It's a difficult time, a, pain, a painful time almost. A time when we don't know who comes home and who doesn't. A time of extraordinary danger. So what do you do? Like him, the Jewish people take with them an aron, a cask, an ark, Hamechel is shivre haluchas that contains the chips, the pieces of the luchas. Hamahavim, which ultimately, by virtue of their very existence, by dint of the fact that they are broken pieces of what was once luchot, what did they create automatically? A telltale sign. They 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 bring to memory and to mind chet ego. By virtue of the fact that they are broken luchot, that's what they say. They're screaming. The Jewish people did a terrible sin. The Jewish people built a golden calf, even though they heard from Hashem, and they heard from the voice of God himself at our Sinai, don't have other gods. A short 40 days and nights later, they built themselves a golden calf. Chet hachomer b'yesa. This is, in case you're wondering, the most egregious, the most heinous sin 
Shechatu b'nei Yisrael Ipam, the Jewish people ever sinned. The worst thing we ever did is build a golden calf. Because of what the golden calf was, because of when it was built, because of how it was built, because of where it was built. It's the worst sin we ever did. So why at a time when we need Hashem's mercy, would we bring to mind something which represents the opposite of mercy or the opposite of merit? And I'll add parenthetically that Yom Kippur, which serves as a day of atonement, and originally as atonement for Chet Egel, is the one time a year the Kohen Gadol enters the Holy of Holies and he changes his clothes. Why a change of wardrobe? Because the golden clothes become a vivid indicator of the golden calf. And we don't want to bring to memory the golden calf. So he wears white clothes. And the idea of the white clothes is pure. We want to stay away from that. We, want to, we don't want to emphasize it. Why well, it's not a good thing. We never bring our merit? Why do you say that? We certainly don't bring forth our demerits. Do you know that in a shiva house we don't say tachnum? We don't say the prayers, the traditional prayers. How come? You ever wonder? We don't say tachnum when it's a happy day, when it's a joyous day, it's a yomtiv. We don't say tachnum when there's a chasen or a kala that's, that's around. Why? Because it's a wedding, it's joy. The joy eclipses and gets rid of the darkness of sin. That's the nature of joy. Joy sweeps, sweeps us into a higher place. So why don't we say tachnum in a shiva house? Because we're joyous? Because the Shiva house is a place of dinim, a place of divine severity and judgment. This is where a family is bereaved, the family is mourning. And because of that, we don't want to start saying, Ashamnu Bagadnu. Hey, <laughs> let me tell you why maybe we should be judged. Because Ashamnu and Bagadnu and Gazalnu and the Barnu Defi, because we did all kinds of things which are inappropriate. So you don't want to, shh, don't mention it. Not here. We don't bring forth that which is a, a, the opposite of the merit. We don't emphasize a demerit. Why would we bring Shiva Eluchas? It's like the dumbest thing we could do. Or so it would seem. So obviously, when a hecher claim, we must say, if I, there has to be not only a demerit, which is obvious, but there also has to be something meritorious about the, the luchot. The luchot, the, the pieces of the luchot are telling another story. Besides the fact that they are obviously telling the story that the luchot had to be broken by Moshe Rabbeinu in order to save the Jewish people to say face and a situation. In addition to this, it is, it is necessary for us to say that the Shivri Haluchot also tell a, a tale, they bring forth a narrative which is of a limud zuchut, which is in some way meritorious. It's telling a positive story. A limud zuchut koi gadol v'nifla, a meritorious narrative that's so profound, so powerful, who gave it al achshash, that it eclipses and it transcends the possibility that maybe this will bring forth something which is less than happy and less than positive. We must say so. So not only it has to be a limud zuchut, not only it has to be something that tells another story, a narrative of merit, a narrative of goodness, a narrative of inspiration, it has to be such a powerful positive narrative that it eclipses and casts aside the negative one, transcends it altogether. And that's a, it's a very bold statement, but the question of course is, so, how so? So this is what the Rebbe explains like this. The Bir Hadvar. Chazal Mesaprim. Our sages relate. And this is found in Ovest of Nasan in the second chapter. Shekashiyarad Meisha Mahar Sinai. When Meisha Benu came down from the mountain. La'achar Chet Ha'egel. After the sin of the golden calf. It says, and this is a quote. Nistakel Bohen. He looked into them. He's referring to the Luchot here. The Ra and he saw. Sheparach Ksav Me'aleyem. He saw that the inscription was, was flying off. The inscription was literally separating itself. Remember, the inscription was not written letters. These were engraved letters. That the engraved letters were literally flying off the tablet. Omar, Moshe Rabbeinu said, How will I give them luchot? Blank, empty slabs of stone? Luchot which will be she'en bahem mamash, which have no meaning? which have no content, which, which then have no value? I can't do that. Ella, rather, Echoes, let me grasp them, Vashabrim, and let me shatter them. Now there's many, many interesting ruminations from the Rebbe, from other G'dayli Yisrael. What is the meaning of Echoes? Why did I first grasp it? Why, why does it just say Ashabrim? I don't want to go into that. That's not, that's not the subject, that's not the focus of this morning's class. Here's the focus 
that we should right now engage in. Here's what we need to look at. Meisha's calculation is a little bit strange. Granted, the writing flew off. Now they were empty. But that doesn't mean it doesn't mean they have no value. It doesn't mean that they have no virtue. It doesn't mean that. How do I know? These two slabs of stone still possessed extraordinary virtue. What was the virtue? What made these slabs of stone different from any other? What are you talking about? These are luchos shaim maise elikim. These are luchos that the Torah describes as act of God luchos. This was not just slabs of stone. These were acts of God, creations of God slabs of stone. In other words, godly slabs of stone. Like we have in Pirkei Ovis. The hamichtav, michtav elikim, it says the writing is the writing of God. Luchos maise elikim. So the luchos themselves were not ordinary stone. As the Alshech explains, that the luchas were actually living stone. They lived, they breathed, there was a living organism. They were crafted, they were made by, by God Himself. They're worthless now. They're empty, devoid of content. They're no different than any other slabs of stone. What are you talking about? So much so, Shehichlet Linig Behem Bederach Bizoyin, Meish Rabbeinu treated them with, in a disgraceful way. He simply shattered them. He didn't take these slabs of stone and say, you know, these slabs of stone once used to house the writing of Hashem. So now these slabs of stone, which once very important, I'm gonna, no, he took them and smashed them. He said, Rabbeinu Shalayla, Meisha, why'd you smash them? He says, because, because they were meaningless. They're meaningless? They're Meisha Likim who? Meisha Likim is meaningless? So what's, what's the explanation? Says the Rebbe, Omnam, indeed it's true. Haluchas hoyo ma'isi It's true, the luchas were the act and act of God. Uvda, that's a description of something, a reality which is a ma'ilag day live in a flaw. Extraordinary virtue, very lofty and very special reality. But, la'achar shenechiku behem aseres hadibreis. After these luchot, which were my se'elikim, after they had the writing engraved in them, they were no longer now just act of God stones, they were no longer special slabs of stone, but they became elevated and transformed by dint of the writing to the point, it's not that before the luchot were my se'elikim, now they're still my se'elikim, but there's also the virtue of the concept of mikhtev of the writing of God. No, not so. What was once virtuous and special because it was Maiselikim, because it was an act of God, because it was fashioned by the hand of God, now becomes ever so much more virtuous and ever so much more special and unique because it goes from the level of being Maise, an act of God, to becoming Michtav, to becoming the writing of God, which is a Darga Gavoya Le'ena Reich, a much higher level than Maiselikim. So once that happens, once that tra- it underwent that transformation, the previous virtue is all but forgotten. It became so much more special that it was, right at this point, it became, it's irrelevant that it was used for that purpose the first time or that it was so special the first time because now it's ever so much more meaningful, ever so much more special. I'll give you an example. Why, not write, why write the second luchas? Because you need to have luchas. On the contrary, because the, because, the, because after the luchas lost the writing, once it went into that level and then it lost the writing, it lost its value altogether. I'll give you a simple example. You could have something which is sentimental. For whatever reason. It's sentimental to you. No, 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 not a big sentiment. There's some small sentiment attached to it. And because it has that small sentiment attached to it, you decided to use it for a much more sentimental purpose. And now you don't refer to that item that object as sentimental because of reason A, now you refer to it as sentimental for reason B. Because, because it's much, it's, the reason that it was used for, for sentiment B is because it was once used for sentiment A. But once it was used for sentiment B, the fact that it was, there's a previous story, the previous narrative is forgotten altogether because it goes into a much, much loftier level. But it was still a symbol of the mistake Okay, let me give you a silly example. Let me give you a silly, silly example. Let's say 
that um, somebody has something which was used for a purpose, whatever it is. And then they decide, because it was used for that purpose, they decide that they're going, in fact, to use that very, very same object for their marriage, for example. Okay, let's say there's a certain article of clothing. The article of clothing was special. I was a special because you once did something special with it. Nothing like life altered, something special. So you know, that same article of clothing I did, I'm going to use it now for, for the marriage. And then what happens? God forbid the marriage dissolves. A very, very terrible, terrible divorce. So that object, which once had some kind of sentimental value previously, all of a sudden, now it's worthless to you. In fact, they want to get rid of it because it reminds you of this terrible union that has long shadows and really is something you want to forget. So you come along and say, hey, but you know, it was valuable before the wedding too. Say, listen, before the wedding, whatever that was, I don't even remember that. This object was vastly elevated. And precisely because it was vastly elevated, now it's so worthless. Why? Because once the value, the second value is taken away, the first value is... Is, is for the first value, we forgot even why we used it to begin with. And now it's a symbol not of that first sentimental moment. Now it's a symbol of the second major sentiment, which has turned sour. That's the luchas. When the luchas, the letters, literally flew off the tablets, the luchas were michtav, they're no longer michtav. The fact that it was once Maiselikim, that it was once an act of God's stones, and now became God's stone that had God's writing in it, and once that writing was stripped from it, Ein Behem Mamash. Shekain, Ma'amodam Kim Maiselikim, that the value, the virtue, the, the station that it accomplished, or the, that, it, that, that it, it, it held as Maiselikim, Hoyer Kvar Choser Erech Beinayim. That was already, that, you know, that's. That was so like, you know, 2014. Now it's 2016. It's like, that, ah, that was so, that was so old. Who cares what it, the Maise Elikim was not really the focus anymore. Now the focus was the Michtev Elikim. If you kind of look at the blank stones, you're being reminded of what you lost. Right? That's correct. You look, when you would see the blank stones, you would remember that this used to be Michtev Elikim. And now, and now it's not. Why? Why? Because the Jewish people sinned. So the virtue of value, a level, that it had before, <laughs> compared to the level that's greater than it, which is Michtav Elikim, is all but forgotten. Zui Asiba, this is the reason, my friends. That the Oren and its chips of stone would go out to war. Because those pieces, those shards, those, 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 those chips of stone contained within them a very powerful message, a very deep and overwhelming, profound narrative, which is important for warfare. Why? Why does Am Yisrael go to war? I'm not saying why Jewish people might go to war. There were Jewish people who joined various armies and fought valiantly over the ages. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the veterans from World War II who went, signed up, some of them, two years before they were 18, faking their age so they can go and fight Hitler. I'm not talking about that. But why did Jewish people as a nation go to war, not as individuals who would join with another nation? When Jewish people have gone to war traditionally as a nation, what was that war connected to? Let's talk about the beginning of our history. We talked about counting the people, establishing a formation, a formation of battle-ready formation. What was that battle-ready formation for? When the Aaron would go before them, why was the Aaron going before them? What was the point of having that Aaron? What's the answer? The answer was, Al-Mechemes Kibush Eretz Yisrael. This was all about capturing the Holy Land of Israel. So this capturing the Holy Land of Israel, this idea of not being satisfied with the previous situation, of need, needing to go to war to elevate whatever the previous situation was, the Jewish people were living in the desert, for example, and they had this wondrous manna to eat, and Moshe Rabbeinu was teaching them Torah, and they said, no, that's not good enough. Why is it not good enough? A beautiful existence. In fact, the spies wanted to stay there. <clears throat> In the desert, they certainly reached a very a towering level of spiritual accomplishment. The Torah's message to us is, that's not good enough. Don't be satisfied. We need to go and capture the land of Eretz Yisrael, from the hands of the nations who occupy it, 
and to make that very land a didolak kadosh baruch. In other words, the whole message of the luchos is that you could be at a very lofty level, but you're not going to remain at that level. You're going to take it to the next level. Why? Because the next level is so much more important and so much more profound that once you achieve the next level, the previous virtue or accomplishment will simply fade by comparison. And that's the message of the luchos. The luchos were mikhtevalik, were maiselikim, a virtue, a tremendous, tremendous level, much more special than ordinary stone. But once it reaches the next level, once it becomes inscribed with the words, oh, we even forget a fact of maiselikim. The Jewish people are a great virtue. They're very, very special. They're a nation who's learning Torah in a desert, eating manna, sequestered and separated from the rest of the world. All true. But this nation will now go into Eretz Yisrael. And in going into Eretz Yisrael, this nation is going to become vastly elevated. In fact, incomparably changed and transformed. Because that's the idea of Dira B'tachtainim. So the koyach, that inspiration, the strength, the courage, and the fortitude, the metal that is needed, mikablim, yeti amokhamed, those who go out to war, receive that from the story, the narrative, the message that's broadcast by Shivri Haluchas. Sha'af heim hivu, bitui. They, they become a very vivid example, a very profound and powerful expression of this idea. The ihistapkos, the lack of satisfaction with status quo. It's not good enough just to be In fact, the fact that they were just maise, just an action, in comparison with the idea of writing, it's not even a comparison. It, it, it's, it's, almost, it's, it's all forgotten because of the tremendous acceleration in our spiritual growth. This is why a yid goes to war. This is why a yid goes to battle. Not to be simply staying in the same place not to be satisfied with past accomplishments, but rather to be able to take it to the next level. And the message that inspired Am Yisrael as it went into battle to capture Eretz Yisrael was the story that the luchos or the pieces of those luchos themselves told. Chaim.